Chapter 3 The 144,000 New Testament Jews The 144,000 will speak the testimony of Jesus. Before we consider the mission of the 144,000, we need to consider how Jesus selects this group. During the Great Tribulation, there will be several surprising and disturbing developments. One of the biggest surprises will be who constitutes the 144,000. Jesus will bypass most pastors, priests, rabbis, imams, religious experts, and scholars. Instead, he will select 144,000 ordinary people, both men and women, from all over the world who will serve as his spokesperson. See Joel 2, 28-30. If we assume the population of the world is reduced to about 6 billion people after the first four trumpets occur, and if we assume the 144,000 are evenly distributed around the world because God loves everyone the same, one of God's prophets will serve approximately 42,000 people. This is how the testimony of Jesus will be delivered to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Matthew 24, 14 and Revelation 12, 17, chapter 19, verse 10. Many Christians are aware that the 144,000 will be chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel, Revelation 7, 4, but there is a big surprise coming. The twelve tribes today are not the twelve tribes described in the Old Testament. The Father replaced Old Testament Jews with New Testament Jews when Jesus was on earth. The Old Covenant was abolished and a New Covenant was established at that time. A New Testament Jew is a person who has been born again through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Millions of New Testament Jews are living on the earth today. Such a person is eager to know the truth, has an honest heart, loves God with all his heart, mind, and soul, and his neighbor as himself. Jesus assigns a person to one of the twelve New Testament tribes when he is born again. Therefore, only God knows the tribe to which each New Testament Jew belongs. When the time for Jesus to select the 144,000, he will have many people from which to make his selection because there are over 12,000 members within each tribe. Notice how the Bible indicates that in the last days each tribe is larger than 12,000. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were selected. Revelation 7, 5. The 144,000 will serve as God's prophets during the Great Tribulation. While they will be few in number compared to the population of the world, they will be like Gideon's tiny army of 300 who delivered Israel from the oppression of the huge Midianite army. See Judges 7, 7 and Judges chapter 6, verse 5. God used Gideon and his tiny army so Israel would know that the Lord himself had provided the victory. During the time of the seven trumpets, God will use another tiny army to spread his gospel over all the world. They will achieve a result that Christians have not accomplished during the last 2,000 years. Jesus will evangelize 6 billion survivors through the 144,000 in a mere 1,260 days. When Jesus selects the 144,000, he will appear to them in a vision. Like Ezekiel, Jesus will give them a book to eat, or his words to speak. 
Compare Ezekiel 3, 1 to 4 with Revelation 10, 8 through 11. Many Christians have not considered the distinction between New Testament and Old Testament Jews. Please consider these. 1. New Testament Jews have a high priest from the tribe of Judah, Hebrews 7, 12 through 21. Old Testament Jews had a priest from the tribe of Levi, Hebrews 7, 11 and 12. Number 2. Jesus is the high priest for New Testament Jews. He serves in the true temple which is located in heaven. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Old Testament Jews do not have a temple because the Romans destroyed it in A.D. 70. Number 3. New Testament Jews consider their capital city to be the New Jerusalem. Revelation 3, 12 and Revelation 21, 2. Even Abraham anticipated God would someday construct this city. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, John 14, 2 and 3. Old Testament Jews consider Jerusalem to be their capital city. Number 4. New Testament Jews have nothing to do with Zionism or modern Israel. The kingdom they expect to inherit is not located in the Middle East. Instead, it will be on the earth made new. John 18, 36 and 37, and Matthew 5, 5. 5. New Testament Jews live according to a new covenant that Jesus initiated. See Luke 22, 20 and Hebrews 12, 22 to through 24. Old Testament Jews cannot accomplish the requirements of the Old Covenant because they have no temple. Deuteronomy 12. 6. Paul says New Testament Jews have a much better set of promises and prophecies than those God gave to the Old Testament Jews. Hebrews 8, 6. 7. Paul described a New Testament Jew saying, A man is not a Jew if he has only one outwardly, as the result of circumcision of the flesh, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and the circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the writ a written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Romans 2, 28 and 29. And compare with Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Number 8. New Testament Jews believe God regards them as the seed of Abraham and heirs of the promise given to him. Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Old Testament Jews also believe that they are the seed of Abraham, but they have to assume their lineage because there are no records proving their ancestry. The Roman army destroyed all Jewish genealogical records in AD 70. There are other parallels between Old Testament Jews and New Testament Jews worth considering. 1. Jesus delivered Old Testament Jews from Egyptian slavery. See Exodus 12, 29, Judges 2, 1 through 6. Jesus delivers New Testament Jews from slavery to sin through his indwelling power. See Romans 6, 20 through 22, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and Galatians 6, 15. 2. After Old Testament Jews went through the Red Sea, they were no longer Pharaoh's slaves. After New Testament Jews are born again and go through the watery grave of baptism, they are no longer Lucifer's slaves. See Romans 6, 3 through 5, and verses 14 through 18. 3. 
God did not permit the first generation of Old Testament Jews to enter Canaan because they had no faith in him. Even after they crossed the Red Sea and God fed the manna from heaven for two years, they would not believe that he could tear down the great walls of the cities in Canaan. God became angry with their unbelief and the first generation of Old Testament Jews died in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. See Psalms 95, 10 and 11 and Hebrews 3, 19. New Testament Jews understand that they will not enter the Promised Land and the New Jerusalem unless they maintain a non-negotiable faith in God. Hebrews 11, 6. A non-negotiable faith in God means obeying God without regard for the consequences, trusting that He will make all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28. Number 4. God kept His promise. He took Abraham's descendants into the land which he had promised, but Old Testament Jews could not stay there because of apostasy. Thus far, New Testament Jews have not received the land which God promised to give to Abraham, but they believe that they will inherit the earth which includes everything promised to Abraham's descendants. Number 5. God miraculously sustained Old Testament Jews for 1,500 years, from 1437 B.C. to A.D. 70. He has miraculously sustained New Testament Jews for the past 2,000 years, from A.D. 30 to the present. 6. Old Testament Jews anticipated, and still anticipate, a Messiah that would be an ordinary mortal. Old Testament Jews were monotheists. They believed that there is one God and God could not possibly come to earth as the Messiah. New Testament Jews believe in three gods, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Some New Testament Jews believe that God is co-eternal, distinct, and separate member of the Deity along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Some New Testament Jews believe that Jesus is a co-eternal, distinct, separate member of the Deity along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. New Testament Jews anticipate that two gods will gloriously return, the Father and the Messiah, who will sit at the Father's right hand at the second coming. See Matthew 26, 64 and Revelation 6, 16 and 17. The Holy Spirit will also be present at the second coming, living within every saint. See 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, 1 Peter 4, 14, 2 Timothy 1, 14. Number 7. Old Testament Jews believe the way to eternal life was through self-righteousness. That is, sinners achieve salvation through rigid conformity to the laws of Moses and the Ten Commandments. See Matthew 19, 16 through 26. If a righteous man had any deficiency before God, Abraham's righteousness would make up for it. See Matthew 23, 15, Genesis 15, 6, and Luke 3, 8. New Testament Jews believe that the Levitical laws were temporary from the beginning. They were a shadow representative of events to come. Jesus abolished the Levitical Code initiated by the New Covenant and died on the cross. See Luke 22:20, 20, 2 Corinthians 3:6, Colossians 2:9 through Colossians 3:1. In addition to this, some New Testament Jews believe that Jesus did not abolish the Ten Commandments at the cross, 
because they function as a covenant or a promise. They believe the Ten Commandments describe a person's natural behavior when his sinful nature is removed and God's laws are written in his heart and mind. See Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. 8. If you are a New Testament Jew, you have been born again. You understand that for as long as the sinful nature remains within you, you must live in a state of humility. See Matthew 5, 5, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Sooner or later, some sin will trip you up. The sinful nature will not allow a born-again person to live in perfect conformity with God's will very long. See 1 John 2, 1 and 2, and chapter 5, verse 16. However, if we sin and genuinely regret it, and if we are willing to make restitution if needed to make it right, Jesus is willing to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9 Through faith in God and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, New Testament Jews know that victory over sin is possible and the fruits of the Spirit are promised to all overcomers. See Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Number 9. Old Testament Jews anticipated, and they still anticipate, that God will establish His kingdom on earth. New Testament Jews anticipate that God will establish His new kingdom on earth, but only after He has destroyed the wicked and purified the earth of sin by fire. See Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. The New Covenant Many Christians have heard about the New Covenant Jesus implemented, but few understand its ramifications. While on earth, Jesus terminated the original covenant made with Abraham's descendants. See Exodus 19, 4 through 6, Leviticus 26, and Deuteronomy 28, by initiating a new covenant, Luke 22, 20. It is important to understand that Jesus did not hastily or arbitrarily make up a new covenant. God promised a new covenant 600 years earlier when he sent Israel into Babylon. See Jeremiah 31, 31, and Hebrews 8, 8 and 9, and at chapter 9, verse 15. The Father planned to implement a new covenant all along because from the beginning he intended to unite Jews and Gentiles who believed in Jesus into one body of believing people. See Ephesians 3, 4 through 12. The Father planned before the world was created that salvation would be based on the ministry, life, and death of Jesus. This is why the Old Covenant had a sunset provision from the beginning. See Colossians 2, 9 through chapter 3, verse 1. Progressive Revelation The Father reveals Himself and His plans in small steps over time. We know much more today about God's ways and plans than Moses or David did. Before Jesus created the world, the Father planned to abolish His covenant with Israel so that a new covenant could be established in its place. Paul said, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery 
is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together of the promise in Jesus Christ. See Ephesians 3, 2-6. From the beginning the Father has loved the whole world, and He designed that whosoever will could be a member of the kingdom of God. God chose the descendants of Abraham to teach the world about his love and the coming kingdom. But Israel failed. After Jesus came to earth and established the new covenant, God no longer needed the biological descendants of Abraham. Instead, God created a new Israel made up of whosoever will. Paul explained the Father's plans to Gentile converts in Ephesus, saying, But now in Christ Jesus, you, Gentiles, who once were far away from the Father, have been brought near to the Father through the blood of Christ. For he himself, that is Jesus, is our peace. He who has made the two kingdoms, Jews and Gentiles, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the old covenant, and the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the Levitical law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two nations, thus making peace, and in this one body of people to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their religious hostility. He, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, the Jews. For through him we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you Gentiles are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. New Testament Jews, and members of God's household, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2, 13 through 20. The new covenant terminated the sacrifices and offerings of the old covenant. It also terminated the importance of being a biological descendant of Abraham. Of course, Old Testament Jews considered, and today still consider, the New Covenant blasphemous. They attempted to kill Paul for making inflammatory statements against the Old Covenant. See Acts 23, 20, and 21. However, Paul could not have described the New Covenant more clearly when he wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, 28 and 29. The new covenant created a new Israel, a self-selecting body of whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 and see also a Re- Revelation 22.17. Because Jesus abolished the old covenant and implemented the new covenant with his blood, whosoever will can now be an heir of Abraham through faith in Jesus. Abraham's heirs are not people born of the flesh, but of the spirit. See John 1, 12 and 13, Romans 8, 14, Romans 9, 8. Salvation comes through faith in God, not through biological heritage. Hebrews 11, 6. God promised Abraham, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations including many nations other than Israel. 
and I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Genesis 17, 4, chapter 26, 4, chapter 17, 8. This covenant has not been realized. Yet looking into the future, God showed John the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham, and John wrote, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Revelation 7, 9 During the Great Tribulation, a numberless crowd of believers in Jesus will come from many nations and will be counted as the faithful descendants of Abraham. God's original promise to Abraham included Gentiles, the people from many nations. The New Covenant makes this possible because Jesus abolished the wall that separated Jews and Gentiles. Now all who live by faith are counted as God's children. Ephesians 2.14 This is what Paul meant when he wrote, All Israel will be saved. Romans 11.26 Finally, 25 years after Jesus ascended, the Apostle James, the president of the church at the time, understood the 12 tribes of the Old Covenant had been replaced by 12 tribes belonging to the New Covenant. He addressed his epistle to New Testament Jews, saying, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations because of the persecution by the Jews and the Romans. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. James 1.1 1, 1, and chapter 2, verse 1. 144,000 distributed by population. During the Great Tribulation, Jesus will speak through the 144,000, and the entire world will hear the testimony of Jesus. If we assume the 144,000 will be evenly distributed throughout the population of about 6 billion people, those surviving the first four trumpets, there will be a ratio of about one prophet per 42,000 people. To put this ratio into perspective, suppose the population of the United States after the fourth trumpet is 250 million. The U.S. would have about 6,000 of the 144,000, and India, with 1 billion survivors, would have about 24,000 of the 144,000. To confirm their divine appointment, Jesus will give the 144,000 an infusion of Holy Spirit power never before seen. They will do all kinds of miracles at will, even holding back the rain, as did Elijah. See James 5:17. These have power to shut heaven, that it did not rain in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Revelation 11:6. It is important to understand that before the 144,000 receive divine power and begin their ministry, God will first remove their sinful natures and seal their hearts so that they will not use this amazing power inappropriately. 
God will seal the 144,000. The 144,000 will be given pure hearts before they begin their work. This will happen when Jesus removes their sinful natures. See Revelation 7, 3. The 144,000 will be dedicated to the glory of God. Their motives will be pure and their actions will be selfless, just like Jesus when he was on earth. According to Paul, when a person is born again, he receives the seal of God. This seal of ownership is not visible to the world, but the world will notice a life transformed by divine power because there is a change in his words and conduct. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 Every born-again believer receives a deposit of Holy Spirit power when he surrenders himself to obey Jesus. This deposit of power transforms or sanctifies the sinner. When Jesus seals the 144,000, their deposit will be fully filled. That is, Jesus will remove their sinful nature and they will be wholly sanctified. The 144,000 will be free of sin's tempting power like Adam and Eve before they fell. Once a person has his sinful nature removed, he will not live in a state where his sinful and spiritual natures are in conflict. See Romans 7, 5-8 in chapter 11. A person without sinful nature will naturally do God's will at all times and in all circumstances. This is entirely different from the current human experience. See Romans 7, 20 and 21. After Jesus removes their sinful natures, he will fulfill this covenant with them. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hebrews 8.10 God calls the 144,000 first fruits, Revelation 14.5 because they will be the first to experience this covenant. The 144,000 will be the first to be set free from their sinful natures. The really good news is that Jesus promises to set everyone free. Whosoever will can enjoy his covenant if he is willing to live by faith. Revelation 13.10 and 1 John 5.4 Prostitutes, addicts, murderers, swindlers, and predators will be sealed, just like the 144,000, after they show Jesus that they are willing to live by faith and to obey his gospel. I do not know of an amnesty that offers more. Intense Conflict Most of the clergy will despise the 144,000 because Jesus will say things through them that make the clergy furious. The same thing happened when Jesus was on earth. The Father spoke through Jesus' mouth, and the clergy of Israel were so incensed they plotted to kill him. Acts 3.15, John 12.49 and 50. The 144,000 will respond to every charge and accusation with words that cannot be defeated because Jesus will do the speaking. The whole world will hear the testimony of Jesus with clarity and authority. Revelation 1, 9, Revelation 12, 17, and Revelation 19, verse 10. The 144,000 will exalt Jesus in the same way that Jesus exalted the Father. 
They will present Bible truths. Bible truth will cause a firestorm of controversy because the 144,000 will use it to expose and confront every false doctrine. The testimony of Jesus and Bible truth will infuriate almost everyone, but the honest-hearted people within each religious system will eventually wake up and embrace it. The enabling power of the Holy Spirit will cause many to recognize Jesus' voice speaking to them through the 144,000, who will be attacked, persecuted, punished, and accused of blasphemy. See John 10, 27. Eventually, most, if not all of them, will be killed. Remember that Jesus, John the Baptist, nine of the twelve apostles, and most of God's prophets were killed for speaking the words God gave them to speak. See Matthew 23, 37. After the first four trumpet judgments occur and the survivors are in a state of shock, religious leaders will loudly proclaim God's wrath has fallen because of man's wickedness. They will falsely claim that more judgments are coming unless the whole world immediately changes its behavior. The 144,000 will boldly refute these religious leaders, declaring that no more judgments are coming for the next two and a half years. And when the fifth trumpet does occur, it will not be a judgment producing global destruction. People will be confused. People will question who is telling the truth. This controversy will lead honest-hearted people to search the Bible because the Bible is the only sacred writing on earth that reveals the truth about God, His character, ways, and plans.